Thank you for saying the title so I don't have to. Um, my name is Tatiana Bradley. I am a student at UC Irvine, and this is joint work with my advisor, Stas Jaretsky, and my colleague, Jai Yushu. I'm going to be talking about strong asymmetric password authenticated key exchange. Um, so I'm going to explain what the problem is, which is password authentication over the internet. Um, explain how we can use crypto to do it better, and show our protocol, which we believe is one of the best ways to use crypto to do password authentication better. I'll show you some building blocks, and then I'll discuss some um, open questions that still remain. So how is password authentication done in practice now? Um, it's basically just password over TLS. So um, if we have a server, Charles, he has um, a password file, which, is a, which has a salt and a hashed, uh, pa salted hash of the password. And he's going to uh, prove to Ada that he has um, the right public key using a certificate authority. And then they're going to use TLS to establish a um, shared session key, which is just going to be a symmetric key. And so all of this has nothing to do with pa passwords yet. But then now Ada is going to simply encrypt her password under that shared symmetric key. Charles decrypts it and checks if it is, matches the hashed password. So it's very simple. But there's at least two problems with this method. One is, um, of course, that it relies on PKI. And we all know there are many attacks on PKI. One example is phishing. Uh, Ada believes she's talking to Charles, but she's actually talking to a malicious server. Um, and if that's the case, then she basically just sends her password to a malicious server, and all of her uh, security regarding her password is lost. The other problem, which is a little bit more subtle, is that at least for some number of milliseconds or whatever, um, Charles holds the password of Ada in the clear. So that means if Charles's server is corrupted at any point while he's checking that password, uh, the adversary who corrupts the server learns what that password is. So we'd like to be able to do better with crypto. And um, of course we can because we're at crypto. So our first attempt is going to be uh, to use password authenticated key exchange, which is a well-established primitive. Um, it's been studied in the game-based, simulation-based models, as well as the universally composable model. Um, so how does that work? We assume Ada and Charles each have a password. They insert it into a PIG protocol. Um, and then they get the same key if their passwords match. Otherwise, they get an independently random key. And um, you can think of this as just like a secure computation of a password equality function with the addition of getting keys. So what are the uh, good things about this? No PKI attacks, because there's no PKI. So we're good for that problem with TLS. Um, and the other good thing is that Charles doesn't get Ada's password in the clear during the protocol because it's a secure, secure computation, so her password is private. But of course, in order to be a server, Charles needs to store the password on his server that he inserts into the protocol. So basically, we have an even worse problem with the server, with the server storing a password in the clear because it's, so, it's stored for a long time, not just a couple seconds. So um, we hope to do a little bit better than this. And um, the, here we have something called asymmetric PIG. And uh, this has also been studied in the game base and UC models. And this is a simple extension of PIG in which instead of storing just a password, Charles the server stores a hash of that password. So you can think of f here as a one-way function. We, of course, have the same um, pros of PIG, normal PIG. And then we get the added pro that if the server is compromised, then um, the adversary has to do an off offline dictionary attack in order to learn the password um, based on that password file. But because the function f is a public fixed function, um, any computation for that offline dictionary attack can occur before the actual server compromise. So basically, the adversary who has some time on their hands can do a bunch of computation. And then once uh, they get access to the server, immediately determine what a lot of the passwords are. So we want to do even better than that. And this is where we have strong asymmetric pake. And this is recently proposed at Eurocrypt by, um, by my advisor and my colleagues um, in 2018. And I, um, the way this works is probably how you thought it would, which is instead of holding a uh, regular 
a unsalt or unrandomized function, we use a randomized function. So we just add a salt, a random salt. And um, now we get the benefit that there is no possibility of offline dictionary attack uh, pre-computation because the salt is per user and uh, it's not known beforehand. So finally, we are able to use crypto and get all the benefits of a password over TLS, but none of the shortcomings. So this is great. Um, but what's our contribution here? Because this is already existing. So uh, just to recap, we have password over TLS, the current uh, de facto standard. This is nice because it's standard. It uses TLS. It's efficient. It's modular. Basically, it doesn't matter um, what hash function you use. It doesn't matter what encryption scheme you use. You just encrypt the password. But as I said, it has the two problems that I mentioned. So OPIC, the protocol proposed at Eurocrypt, um, proposes a universally composable strong APIC that, of course, is independent of PKI. It has three rounds, and it's based on an interactive assumption. And what our contribution is, is that we're proposing a new UC strong um, APIC. And we're able to shave off one round. Um, we have a similar number, number of exponentiations, but we don't have to hash onto a group. Um, we, ha we have a number of assumptions, including ROM. Um, we also use GGM, but that is isolated into um, an offline part of the protocol. Um, and we're also proposing um, some new, pr uh, some new um, pr uh, primitives, the UC tight one-way function and the implicit statement conditional CKIM. Um, and we're showing how we can adapt a existing uh, paradigm for PAKs and for UC PAKs into uh, strong APIC and also shave off one half of that paradigm. So um, it's a nice little result there. So let me get into it, explain each one of these things. So let's start with the uh, tight one-way function. So this is in the UC model. So we have something um, called f stauf, and that's the idealized functionality of a salted tight one-way function. And the salted tight one-way function has some password, some secret password that it knows. And it has some notion of being compromised, and it has some notion of having um, a password attack, uh, password guess being uh, happening against it. So in the case that it's compromised, it sort of just sends a message, OK, I'm compromised. And um, in the proof, or in any kind of proofs using this, we need to, um, when we hear that the server has been compromised, we need to sort of generate some kind of password file that looks legitimate to pretend to have been a real server that has a pa password file. So we have to generate that based on um, usually just some kind of random uh, password. But we don't know what the password is. So we have to generate that without knowing the password. And then um, the, the other functionality of the uh, F stuff is that you can ask it, is this the right password? So it's basically like a, a point function where you're saying, is this the password? It says yes or no, and I learn whether it's the password. And then using that functionality as a simulator, we need to translate the real attacker who is doing some kind of offline uh, local computation, we need to translate that into a password guess. So for example, if the one-way function is just a hash function, it's saying hash of password x. Um, and then we say, okay, since we're a random oracle, we know what that password we know what that password was. And then we say, is this the right password? Yes or no. And then if it is right, we program the uh, password file to have to be um, correspond to that correct password guess. If it's not, we just give it some kind of some kind of junk. So. Uh, as I've been saying, I've, I, I gave an example with the random oracle model. It seems like with this model, you're going to need some kind of idealized computation. Um, yeah, so this is just a description of what a tight one-way function is. Um, basically, you can think of the tight one-way function as being um, you, if you make a password, the, the, best, the best strategy for uh, learning the password from the hash password is simply to guess all the passwords, trial hash them and so forth, so brute force. Um, you can't like, shave off a factor, uh, an exponential factor or something. Um, but yeah, so as I was saying, it's, um, it seems like we're going to need some kind of idealized model for this. So the first example I gave is the hash function, and that's what password over uh, TLS basically uses, um, because the server is storing that hashed password. 
Um, then the other example is the hash and the exponent type, where you have a group element that's the, a random group element that's a salt, and you raise it to the hash of the password. And, that, and we're using a variant of this, and it's been used before. Um, it requires a programmable generic group model in order to show that it's a stealth. But we're okay with that because this tight one-way function is only surrounding the sort of offline part of the protocol in which the adversary is uh, compromising the server. It's not during the actual protocol. So this, this does raise some questions such as, are there, can we prove a tight lower bound for some other arithmetic one-way functions beyond the, uh, the one I just described? There is one caveat, and this is something technical that you can read about more in our paper, but we're actually using a variant of this hash in the exponent, which is similar to the bonai Boyan signature function. And the reason for this is because we don't want the password file to be malleable. And uh, the reason for this is that we don't want the adversary who steals the password file to be able to randomize the password file and then pretend to be the adversary without us being able to tell that they're pretending to be the adversary. So it's kind of a technical point for the proof. But from now on in the talk, I'll just sort of I'll use this f stuff as an abstract uh, primitive. All right, so I told you that we are working with a existing paradigm, um, the encryption plus SBHF paradigm. So let me show you how that works with regular PAKE. If we have, if we go back to our regular setting where we have a, a pass, we have a password on both sides. Um, and let's suppose that Ada wants to prove that she has the right password. So Ada sends a commitment to her password using a public key encryption scheme, and uh, the public key is in the CRS. Um, so she, she commits to her password using the public key encryption scheme, and then Charles creates a statement that's in a, think of like an NP language. He creates a statement that says, okay, this commitment of Ada's encrypts the same password as the one that I have, so it encrypts my password. And of course, the statement could be true or it could be false. Um, and then he plugs the statement into this magic SBHF box. The SBH, SBHF has two algorithms. It has the hash algorithm and the phash algorithm. Um, and phash stands for projection hash. The hash algorithm takes in a statement and it outputs a value and a hash projection. The value is like a secret value. The hash projection, you can think of it as kind of like a key. So the hash projection uh, you can send that to someone, and then they can use the p hash value along with a witness for your statement that, um, to get that same value. So what's happening here is that uh, Charles is showing uh, that, a so if, only if Ada has the witness for her commitment can she recover that, uh, that value. And also, she can't recover it if she encrypted the wrong password because the statement will not be in the language. So that shows, that, that proves to Charles that Ada has the right password, but then Charles has to show Ada the same thing, so you just do the same thing symmetrically on the other side. And that's, and that's how the SBHF plus encryption um, paradigm works. What about with APIC? So with APIC, we just do a simple uh, transformation. We, instead of having Charles have the password, he uh, has the hash of the password, and he, his commitment, um, his statement is that Ada's commitment encrypts the pre-image of, um, the pre-image of his password file, and he instead, enc and he encrypts the password file instead of the password, and so forth. It's just kind of a simple transformation. So that all, that's all fine. And what about for SAPIC? We can do the same thing, but with the salts. But um, what we notice here is that uh, because we basically need to use ROM because of the uh, stealth, uh, as I said, we need to use ROM for the stealth. So if we use ROM, um, we can shave off a whole half of this protocol. Oh, and just, to, just for some context, um, this kind of thing can be done without the random oracle model in general. Um, but if we say, okay, it's fine to use ROM, then we can shave off half of this protocol. So how do we do that? Well, we do, we do need to change some things. So in particular, um, we now have, Ada now has no guarantee that Charles has the right password file. 
um, because she proved that she has the password, but he didn't prove anything. So we need to embed inside of this, this uh, hash projection some more information. So we need CCA security. We need it to be non-malleable. And we also need it to be able to carry a payload, an encrypted payload. So um, because he, because Charles needs to be able to send his password file over to Ada so she can check that he does have the right one and has to be non-malleable so that he can't uh, pretend he had the password file when he didn't really have it. Um, and then this sort of changed SBHF is going to be what we call an implicit statement seek him. All right, so the implicit statement seek him is, works pretty similar to the SBHF. We have a send algorithm that's like the hash algorithm and a receive al algorithm that's like the p hash algorithm. The send algorithm transforms a statement into a key and a ciphertext. The receive algorithm transforms a witness and that ciphertext into a statement and a key. So here, um, it's called implicit statement because the receiver does not need to know what the statement is. Uh, in order to generate the value. And in fact, she retrieves the statement in the, in the course of uh, doing the receiver algorithm. And so that's great because in our setting, the receiver who's going to be the client, Ada, doesn't know what the password file is. She needs to grab it and check it. And then uh, this is a trapdoor conditional uh, CKIM. And so that means we have a trapdoor algorithm that can use a trapdoor and the CRS to compute the same values that Ada can compute. And they look indistinguishable from Ada's values. This is just used in the proof. And we also have simulation stoutness, which you can think of like CCA. And that's that the key appears to be ran the key K that the uh, sender generates appears to be random if the statement he uh, sends is not, in fact, in the language, even given the presence of this trapdoor receiver. So you can think of that like a decryption oracle. And finally, we have statement privacy, which says that the statement is hidden without the witness. And this is, um, the thing I just described is fairly similar to implicit zero, zero knowledge um, pr proposed by Benhamuda et al. Um, but the new thing here is the statement privacy notion. And that's that the statement is hidden. Um, given the ciphertext, you cannot determine what the statement is unless you have the witness. And that's important because if the statement is revealed, then the statement reveals the password file. And then it's as though the adversary compromised the server without even having to do any work. So basically, just by listening on the network, they would get the password file. And we don't want that to be the case. All right, so how do we make the implicit statement trapdoor seek him? I'm not going to go through all the details, but you can think of it like if you're familiar with the Fujisaki Okamoto transform from CPA to CCA public key encryption, you can think of it like that. Basically, what we're doing is we are um, we're encrypting, we're using that, uh, that hash value that we got that we know is the same if those two passwords, if the passwords match, we're using that to encrypt the randomness that we use to make the hash, and also the statement itself, and also just macking everything so that nothing can be changed. Um, and then, then Ada now knows that if Charles sent her a valid ciphertext, that he does have a valid uh, he does have a valid password file, and nothing was changed. So basically, if we tie that all together, what that gives us is this is like the picture before, except now we're using the trapdoor seek him um, and the send and receive function instead. And just to recap, we know that Ada authenticates herself using, um, using the basic seek him security, which is that uh, if she is able to decrypt the Charles's, uh, Charles's ciphertext, then she must know uh, the, the witness and the statement must be correct, so she must have um, encrypted the correct password. And then Charles also authenticates to Ada because he's including his encrypted password file in the payload. So we, we basically just combine um, the, the work that is done by the SBHF, which is the um, authenticating Ada with the authenticating Charles into the same ciphertext. So that's how we shave it down to two rounds, um, and this is our protocol. 
Oh, and um, just, to, just as a note, we instantiate uh, the PKE with a lifted Elgamal, which is just a slight variant of, of Elgamal, um, and with our instantiation of the um, SECAM based on SBHF, we're able to uh, get a very efficient protocol. What I want to highlight for uh, my summary is that we are in, our instantiation is, is quite efficient. Not only does it have two rounds, but it also, in terms of variable, variable base exponentiations, which are much more expensive than fixed base exponentiations, um, we only have one, or, one to two per party. And so if you think of regular Diffie-Hellman key exchange, you would have one variable base per party. So we're actually getting pretty close to that plain, unauthenticated Diffie-Hellman. Um, and that leads into um, one thing I'm particularly interested in, which is integrating this work with TLS. That's our last open question. But some other um, cool open questions are whether there are other tight one-way function constructions, um, like with different assumptions, and maybe we could even get rid of GGM and ROM. Um, is it possible to shave off the rounds from SAPIC even further? Would we be able to make a CKIM faster by using DHIS type transform instead of FO? Um, and finally, could we extend it to two-factor authentication or TPIC? Um, so yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time. All right, we're gonna have some time for questions. Please come to the mic if you have one. So I would have a quick one regarding, um, the, I guess the last bullet point, integration. So my understanding is that OPAC is on its way to potentially being standardized, at least it's a working group item of the CFRG. Do you have any similar plans with that protocol? We don't have any specific plans regarding that, um, and I am aware that OPEC is, is on, its, on the road too, but I, I, I would like to, I don't have specific plans, but I would like to get in on that if possible, yeah. Cool, okay. All right, there are no other questions. Thanks, thanks, Diana again. <laughs>